So the problem we're looking at in this paper is multi-class image segmentation, which is assigning a class label to every pixel in an image. Where class labels can, for example, be chair, table, or background. Now, this multi-class image segmentation is usually approached as a map inference problem in a conditional random field, where the unary term describes on how likely a certain pixel is to take a specific label. And those likelihoods are normally found using uh, first extracting some features from an image and then training a classifier on those features. In our paper, we use Texon Boost, proposed by Schotten et al. And this classifier classifies every pixel independently of one another, such that the final classification can be f fairly noisy or inconsistent over uh, the whole image. So this is why the CRF also contains a pairwise term, which ensures or which uh, encourages a consistent labeling over an image. In the most simple CRF model, a pairwise term is only formulated over directly neighboring pixels. And most commonly used is the color sensitive POTS model, which you can see on the bottom of the slide. And it, it expresses our belief that close by pixels or neighboring pixels with the same color or with a similar color should be labeled the same. Now inference in the simple grid structure or adjacency CRF models is fairly efficient. For example, graph cuts takes roughly a second to do inference in the image here on the side, which contains 50,000 variables. However, the expressive power of those grid structured models is not, ver is not, is very limited. And this is mainly due to the fact that interactions can only be modeled over, di over directly adjacent variables. And the grid structure itself further leads to an excessive smoothing of object boundaries, as you can see on the image on the side here. And this excessive, excessive smoothing is also known as the shrinking bias. Now, what we do in our paper, we use a slightly different CRF model, in which every node has a pairwise connection to every other node. And then we simply vary the strength of this connection. And this is what the model gives us. It's clear since every node has a connection to every node, every other node, we can model both local interactions as well as very long range interactions between different variables in the image. And just by looking at the image here on the side, you can see that the shrinking bias is no longer a problem. Now, we're not the first ones to explore fully connected CRF models. There's been a large body of work in computer vision on how to use fully connected CRF models on region based CRFs. However, they're only tractable up to a few hundred variables. And what we are dealing here with is tens of thousands of variables and billions of edges between those variables, which is computationally much more expensive. So what I'm gonna show you in this talk is how to do efficient inference of those fully connected models. And with, an efficient, effi with efficient inference, I mean inference in a fraction of a second in a model of the size of the image here on the side which contains 50,000 variables. And just as a reference, traditional inference methods just, such as MCMC inference take over a day to do inference in such a model and graph cuts doesn't even converge within three days. The only restriction we have to our model is that the pairwise potential needs to be a linear combination of Gaussian kernels. And what I mean with that is that we take our fully connected model and the pairwise potential in this fully connected model is a product of a label compatibility function mu and a sum, a weighted sum of Gaussian kernels, where the Gaussian kernels can be an, can have an arbitrary shape and they can be formulated over an arbitrary feature space. To be a little more concrete, the model we use in all our experiments is a two kernel model, where the label compatibility function is either a simple POTS model or is learned as a semi-metric function from data. The first kernel in our model is a simple appearance kernel, which just expresses our belief that close by objects with a similar color should, be have, should have the same label. And it's a direct extension of the color sensitive POTS model I showed you earlier in those slides. And the second kernel is just a local smoothness kernel, which, which discourages single pixel noise. 
Now that we've defined our model, what we want to do is we want to find the most likely assignment or the most likely labeling under that model. And we do this using a mean field approximation, where the mean field approximation finds a simple probability distribution Q, which is a product of independent marginals, and it finds Q such that it is, that it is as close as possible to P in terms of the KL divergence. And once we found Q, we can approximate the maximum posteriori simply by taking the maximum of each of the independent marginals. Now, the mean field approximation is found using the formula here on top of the slide. And for a detailed derivation, I would like to refer you to our paper. What this formula says is that we first need to initialize our guess for Q. And we do this to just, we just initialize it to the unary potentials. And then we iterate over a message passing step which propagates all approximations Q from any variable to any other variable in the CRF. Then we apply a label compatibility transformation for every variable independently, add in the unary term, and normalize. Now, it's not hard to see that the computationally expensive part of this mean field approximation is the message passing step, since it requires us to pass a message from every pixel to every other pixel in the CRF. However, by choosing Gaussian edge potentials, this message passing step is nothing else than a high dimensional Gaussian filter or a bilateral filter. And there has been a large body of work in both computer vision and computer graphics on how to evaluate those high dimensional Gaussian filters efficiently. And the method we use is the, called the permittedral lettuce proposed by Adams et al. And I'll now give you some intuition on why those Gaussian filters can be evaluated more efficiently. Let's start by looking at some work done by Paris and Durand. Paris and Durand observed that given an, an arbitrary high dimensional input signal, as soon as it's convolved with a Gaussian kernel, the signal is smooth and band limited, as you can see here in green. And any such smooth and band limited function can be represented by a sparse set of samples, which is a direct consequence of the Nyquist theorem. Now that we know that we can represent the result of the convolution with a sparse set of samples, Paris and Durand proposed the following algorithm. They first downsample the input signal onto the sparse set of samples, then simply blur the sampled signal in the discrete domain, and upsample the signal again into the continuous domain. Now, sampling in an arbitrary high dimensional space is not trivial. And it actually, like the naive sampling requires an exponential number of samples. So exponential in the number of dimensions. And this is known as the curse of dimensionality. This is why Adams et al. proposed the permittedral lattice, which can take an arbitrary high dimensional input signal, shown in green here, and then tessellates the space around that input signal into regular simplices, and then for every point on the high dimensional input signal, it looks at the enclosing simplex, distributes its value onto this enclosing simplex, then blurs the values on the simplices along each dimension of the dis discretization, and then upsamples the signal again by looking at the enclosing simplex and using linear interpolation. So this permutator lattice allows us to take our message passing step in the mean field approximation and replace it with a simple high dimensional filter, leading to an algorithm that is linear in the number of variables and independent of the number of pairwise connections in the CRF. Now we can also do learning using high dimensional Gaussian filtering and we can learn both the label compatibility function mu and the weights of the kernels using a filter. However, learning the shape of the kernel leads to a non-Gaussian convolution which cannot be computed with a filter. And for more details on that, I would like to refer you to our paper. Now let's look at some results. We evaluated our algorithm on two standard data sets. The first one is the MSRC data set, which contains almost 600 images and 21 object classes. And in the MSRC data set, the unary classifier, namely text on boost, already performs fairly well with an 84% accuracy. And the grid CRF 
only improved slightly upon this accuracy mainly by reducing some noise in the segmentation. Now if you look at the fully connected CRF model, it yields a three times higher improvement than the grid CRF and the time required to do inference is roughly a factor of five lower. And now if you look at the segmentations produced by the fully connected CRF, they look much cleaner than the ones produced by either the unary term or the grid CRF. And to measure this cleaner segmentation accuracy, we took 94 images out of the MSRC data set. We hand annotated them pixel accurately and then used something called the trimap evaluation proposed by Coley et al. And the trimap evaluation measures the percentage of the pi of misclassified pixels along object boundaries. And what I mean with that is given an arbitrary image, we look at its pixel accurate segmentation, look at the object boundaries and define the n pixel uh, region around that object boundary as the trimap of size n. And here you see a, a trimap of size 4, this is a trimap of size 8. Now, this here is the trimap evaluation. On the bottom, you can see the fully connected model, which has a much lower uh, error than both the grid CRF or the unary classifier. And here, the numbers show the trimap evaluation for size infinity, which is for the complete image. Now, again, you can see that the fully connected model has roughly a three times improvement over the simple grid structured CRF. So the second data set we evaluated our algorithm on is the VOC 2010 data set, which contains almost 2,000 images, 20 classes, plus a separate background class. And in here, again, the fully connected model improves roughly by a factor of three over the simple grid structured model. Now this far I've only talked about fully connected CRFs in terms of images. But there's nothing restricting neither the mean field approximation nor the filtering to simple images. The only restriction the mean uh, the filtering implies on our algorithm is that we need to use the Euclidean feature space. And we can, for example, use the fully connected CRF to segment point clouds where we use the XYZ position, normal and color of every point as a feature. Or we can apply, uh, we can use it to segment meshes where the XYZ position normal of every vertex is used. So in summary, I've shown you a fully connected model in which pairwise potentials are linear combination of Gaussian kernels. And I've presented you with an efficient inference algorithm in those fully connected models where the inference algorithm is linear in the number of variables and independent of the number of pairwise connections. Now let's look at some future work. One area of future work we're currently investigating is going beyond this simple mean field approximation and finding an approximation algorithm that is more accurate. And I personally believe the key to that is lifting some of the restrictions the filtering imply, uh, the filtering impose on our algorithm, which is the filtering needs to update all variables at once. And finding a filtering algorithm that is that allows us to update single variables at once uh, is what I think is the key to finding a better inference algorithm in those fully connected models. Then the second area we're extending the fully connected model to is continuous variables. And we're currently investigating using, the, using it for depth reconstruction or optical flow estimation. Then another area it's very interesting is extending it to non-Euclidean spaces. For example, in meshes or general graphs, a Euclidean space either doesn't exist or is not very meaningful, such that uh, spaces such as geodesics or diffusion distance are way more meaningful in those spaces. And the last point is going beyond the simple label compatibility function. Right now the label compatibility function is strictly separated from any features in the image. So finding a label compatibility function that can use some of the underlying features in the image will greatly increase the overall accuracy of the, or the, the overall pow expressive power of the model. All right, uh, I'd like to mention that all the code uh, for the fully connected CRF models is available online under the following URL here. Thank you for your attention and feel free to stop by my poster tonight, W14. 
and I'm happy to take any questions. So the question was what, the, what was the computational platform for the timing? So it was a single core machine uh, CPU and it, I think it was an i7-930. Uh, 